Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science at home webinar on our COVID-19 series. Welcome back if you've been joining us all along or if this is your first time tuning in, we're glad you've joined us. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock and I work at the Institute for Science and Policy at Project here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. This series, of course, would not be possible without our great partners from the Colorado School of Public Health. So a huge thank you to them. And of course, a special shout out to Dr. John Samet, the Dean of the School of Public Health, as well as all of my wonderful museum colleagues who helped work to put this together behind the scenes. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, you can find written recaps and recordings on the Institute website. Just go to institute.dmns.org. A little housekeeping before we get started. We're excited to have an audience here on Zoom joining us today, as well as on Facebook Live. We invite you to send in your thoughtful questions and comments all along the way via the chat or the comment feature. Um, we're going to work to and try to incorporate as many of those questions as we can into the Q&A portion of our presentation. A huge apologies if we don't get to all of them. We you all often ask wonderful questions that we just can't get to all of them, but we will try our best. Um, we do have another interactive component today here um, in our presentation. We're going to be doing some live polling. So hey, hey, watch out for that. Um, we've got three questions we're going to be asking you throughout the presentation. It's going to be pretty straightforward for those of you who are here in Zoom. You're going to see a poll pop up. You're going to have about 30 seconds to respond to that question, and then we're going to show the results. If you're on Facebook, unfortunately, you can't participate in the live poll, but you will be able to see the question. We encourage you to maybe drop your answer into the comment feature if you want, or just think about how you would respond to that. So when we get to the results, you can have your little aha, see how you fit into the rest of the responses. So now onto the show. Today is all about ethics. COVID-19 presents a whole suite of ethical questions, such as when is it acceptable to restrict our individual liberties to protect the public? The tensions between individual versus communal, they often expose disagreements over values and priorities. Our guest today is going to explore this question as well as many others, as well as talk about some of the ethical challenges that our medical professionals face. He's going to bring in some history to shed light on the coronavirus and then outline both some science and values based approach to these difficult questions that we often ask ourselves. So I'm excited to have joining me today, Dr. Matt Winia. Dr. Winia is a professor of medicine and public health and the director for the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. He is a specialist in infectious disease along with a long-standing interest in ethics during pandemics and other public health emergencies. His career has included developing a research institute and training programs focusing on bioethics, professionalism, and policy, as well as founding the American Medical Association Center for Patient Safety. He received his medical degree from Oregon Health Sciences University School of Medicine and a master's in public health from Harvard University School of Public Health. He served on numerous committees, authored more than 140 publications, and has been featured in the news. He is also the past president of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. We have a very well-versed expert in today's topics on ethics, so good morning, and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Winia. Thank you, Kristen. This is uh, really a, a great pleasure for me to be here today, and I want to echo your appreciation for uh, John Samet, the Dean at the School of Public Health, and also George Sparks for sort of coming together to create this, uh, this series, which has been so informative and, and helpful to so many people. Um, I also, by the way, want to give a quick shout out um, to a couple of the connectors between our Center for Bioethics and Humanities and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Todd Seiler and Malia Himber um, both deserve special credit for making these connections, um, serving on both our community board and on some of the committees and, and so on that, uh, that are so important to the Denver Museum as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, so that you all can see the slides. Um, does that look okay, Kristen? You seeing it? Okay. Um, so we're going to speak today about ethics in the age of COVID, um, and I am going to uh, I'm going to do this a little bit through um, touching on some historical examples. Um, I'm going to avoid the one that probably everyone expects me to talk about, which is the 1918 pandemic flu, um, and instead I'm going to use a couple of other examples. And before we get started on that. Let me ask this first question. Um, this is a question, by the way, that has been used in a number of public polls nationally. And so one of the reasons we wanted to drop this one in here 
to get us started is because there are some data on how people have answered this in the past. Are people seeing this as a poll question? It's not popping up as a poll yet for me. There it is. Okay, so um, we'll give you a few, uh, a few seconds to, uh, to answer this. And I recognize, by the way, I didn't write this question. This is uh, someone else's question, but it has been validated um, and it has been useful. Um, and like many poll questions, um, it's a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, so we're asking you here, which is more important at the moment? So four months into this pandemic, um, if you had to pick between uh, an effort to slow the pandemic or an effort to slow the economic decline, which would you pick? And I cannot see how many people have answered this yet, but I, I'm guessing we're getting close. Wow. Okay. Well, so um, when this question was asked very early on, um, so back in March, um, the, the results were very similar to that actually nationally, about 85% of people. Um, and that was almost universally true, um, even across different sort of political divides. It's a very unusual thing for the country to be so united. Um, and um, I don't know if our audience is, you know, reflective of the broader public. So, um, so these are, you know, polls for fun, not for uh, scientific purposes. Um, but I will say there is a sense, I think, um, across the country that we made an enormous number of sacrifices to get to where we are today. Um, that we really, a, a lot of people gave up a lot in order to flatten the curve. And probably one of the more frustrating things for folks is to see the recent um, really strong resurgence in cases. And the idea that um, despite all of those sacrifices, uh, we may not have actually crushed this curve and that instead we're seeing that the time we bought um, together, we bought a lot of time for um, federal and state policymakers to try and figure out how to maintain our safety over time. And unfortunately, um, it's starting to look like we bought a lot of time um, and that time may not have been used um, effectively to prevent um, the resurgence of cases. Um, this is the brief outline. I don't have any commercial relationships to disclose, but uh, you all probably know we're supposed to put up a disclosure uh, slide. I'm going to speak to a few historical examples and then um, touch on what I call the three R's of ethics in epidemics. Issues around restrictions on liberty, issues around resource allocation, and how to triage if things get to a point where there are not enough resources for everyone who needs, say, uh, medical care. And then finally, uh, we'll talk some about responsibilities, both professional responsibilities of doctors, of nurses, but also the professional responsibilities of politicians, of scientists, of researchers. Um, and I'm going to speak about all of these in light of sort of three guiding values. Um, and I'll define these a little more as we go along. And, and I just want to say, um, I recognize there are other guiding values that are also important. So I'm going to mention a number of others, but I'm going to sort of use proportionality, reciprocity, and duties as a way of thinking through some of these three R's of uh, ethics and epidemics. And by the way, you'll notice I didn't put research on here. I'd be happy to talk about ethical issues in research around COVID-19 um, during the Q&A, uh, but that's a whole, there, there's a whole slew of ethical issues there that we just won't have time to do in the 15 or 20 minutes uh, to get started. So here's a, an historical picture of a different epidemic, a different pandemic, really. Um, and this is a disease that causes you to get patches on your skin that, um, that become uh, insensitive, where you can't feel heat or cold or pain. And uh, it is preferentially uh, affects the feet and the hands. Uh, so it tends to grow best where things are a little bit cooler. Um, it also tends to affect the nose. The bridge of the nose will often collapse. You'll get a uh, replication of this bug underneath the skin. It causes what's called the leonine face, a lion-like face with um, sort of a lot of folds in the, in the facial skin. Um, 
And it is one of those illnesses that really is a paradigm for the many ways in which, in which um, we uh, manage epidemics that scare us. Um, so this is leprosy or Hansen's disease more properly termed. Um, and the image I have up right now is the Kalapapa uh, leprosarium, the colony where people with leprosy in the United States um, were sent. And leprosy was um, in fact an epidemic disease throughout the, the 1300s and the 1400s in Europe. Um, and in that time frame, uh, people in Spain who developed leprosy or Hansen's disease uh, were declared legally dead. Um, people in Norway who developed Hansen's disease had to wear a cowbell around their neck. And Hansen's disease is very much concentrated in underserved communities, people who are poor, who live in overcrowded conditions, who are potentially malnourished, and who have other medical conditions, comorbid conditions, that make them more susceptible to leprosy or Hansen's disease. And so people with uh, Hansen's disease were often portrayed as being unclean, um, often they would be uh, refused entrance to hospitals. So they were very much um, stigmatized and sort of set aside uh, from the rest of the community. And of course, I put this up because we are seeing many of these same types of dynamics now. The coronavirus is um, clearly hitting the poorer communities, racial ethnic minority communities, um, where people live closer together because of socioeconomic circumstance. Um, and so I just put this up because this was not unexpected. The idea that a pandemic would exacerbate underlying inequalities is something that we um, have worried about for uh, for a long time. And so when it came along, um, most of us who study the ethics of epidemics were not at all surprised to see this. Um, I was also a little bit um, interested in the fact that I put up the LA Times piece here about Mexico's wealthy residents coming to Vail and bringing the pandemic back to Mexico because um, in this Times piece, they specifically talk about how um, the wealthy people will, would be the first to get this, but they would certainly not get it the worst. And in fact, we saw the same thing in the United States. Um, some of you may recall that the first death in the U.S. was in Santa Clara County, California. Santa Clara County being one of the top 10 wealthiest counties in the nation. Um, and this uh, also occurred in Los Angeles. I spoke to a reporter from the LA Times who was telling me that their first cases uh, occurred in the hills, the Beverly Hills, and, um, and in the wealthy areas where people could travel. But it very rapidly spread into the communities um, that are more disenfranchised. And of course, those are now the communities that are being most uh, hard hit. Second little historical um, piece that I wanna put up is the personal protective equipment that people used during the plagues. So many of you will probably have seen this image of the doctor's robe. The doctor's robe was made of muslin cloth dipped in um, wax. So it was a waxy robe that, that draped all the way down to the ground. Um, and the famous part of this is of course the face mask. The face mask is this beak-like uh, appendage that's worn around the face. And that beak would be filled with uh, rags that had sometimes been soaked in herbs or other things, but sometimes people felt like the best way to prevent the humors, which they thought were what transmitted the plague, uh, that the bad humors would be filtered out only if you put something very noxious in there. So sometimes people would soak the rags, say in cat urine, and then, and then put the cat urine soaked rags into this beak and wear it when they went in to examine people who had the plague on the theory that that would prevent the bad humors, the evil humors from the house where the plague victim was from getting in. Um, ironically, uh, there were, as today, there were people who pushed back against the idea that you really ought to wear this personal protective equipment to protect you from the plague. Um, one of the priests in Italy who was, would visit people to do their last rites and would wear this 
Roe, because it was recommended, said he thought it was useless against the plague. The only thing he said it does is because it drapes all the way down to the ground, it keeps the fleas off of you. I'll let that soak in for just a second because of course, um, fleas are what transmit the plague. Um, so, so, so I put this up for a couple reasons. One uh, about this issue of pushing back against using personal protective equipment, which we're seeing again today. Um, but also the plague is probably the sin qua non, the example we use the most often for how we um, end up being forced to choose about restricting individual liberties in order to try to protect the larger community. It was because of the plague that the whole idea of quarantine came about. Quar the word quarantine comes from the Italian quaranta giorni, which is the 40 days that ships had to be uh, kept in the harbor at Venice before they would be allowed to unload their, um, their people and their, uh, and, their, um, and their products because they wanted to try and prevent the plague from coming into Venice. Um, so we are seeing these now, these same kinds of debates and deliberations about the extent to which it's acceptable to require or even for that matter to strongly recommend that people stay home, that people self quarantine, um, or that people wear personal protective equipment. And in large part, of course, today, we're asking people to wear a mask, not so much to protect themselves, but to protect others, to prevent, if they have an asymptomatic case, to prevent them from coughing or sneezing or, um, or even talking or singing. Um, or shouting and having that lead to uh, additional cases. And we're seeing a lot of pushback on these for a variety of reasons, which I'll come back to in just a moment. First though, I wanna mention that there are, and there have been over many years, deliberations about when is it acceptable for public health authorities to use what are called coercive public health measures, to require people to be quarantined, to, be, to require people who are ill to be uh, in isolation, to require that people wear face masks, not merely to recommend it, but to make it a rule. Um, and the Syracuse principles came out of the 1980s, actually, this, is a, uh, this is, was a conference of health law and uh, public health scholars um, and practitioners in Syracuse, Italy in 1984. And they came up with um, the notion that coercive measures should be both legitimate, they need to work, so they have to be effective, first off. Um, they need to fit within the legal framework of your country. They need to actually be necessary, so not optional, but necessary for achievement of the public health goal. And they need to be implemented in a non-discriminatory way. It's interesting, the history of this, because the reason they were called together is because there were countries around the world where sort of strongman dictators were, um, were implementing things like martial law and crackdowns ostensibly because of a, uh, of a threat to the national security or to public health. But in fact, these were, uh, these were just uh, mechanisms for people to seize control of a country. And of course, um, that concern remains today that people use public health threats as a way to, um, as a way to sort of garner authority um, and the other thing I'll, I'll say about this in terms of history is that for those of the, you who study uh, or are familiar with constitutional scholarship, these, um, these principles are very similar to the constitutional principles that require that if the state is going to implement some kind of a restrictive measure, that that measure needs to be the least restrictive uh, means necessary, that it should be, um, that, that it needs to be uh, for, a, uh, for a, a purpose that is clear, um, that it is well targeted, uh, that there's due process. You've probably heard the phrase, a compelling state interest. These are all pieces of our constitutional law which are reflected in the United Nations uh, Syracuse principles. Um, one of the ways in which uh, this shows up in the sort of ethics talk about this, is this principle of proportionality. And the principle of proportionality is really the, the, the idea of not using a sledgehammer when, um, you know, when, a, when a, a, a fly swatter will do. 
not using a chainsaw uh, when a pocket knife would do, that kind of thing. And that comes up a lot in discussions about restricting liberties. It also comes up in talking about resource allocation issues. Don't start to triage people if you don't actually need to triage people. And be constantly aware of the evolving resource uh, constraints. So one of the things that we had a lot of discussion about in establishing the crisis standards of care triage principles for our state um, was to look at how you ensure that the people making triage decisions, if it ever came to that, would be aware of where resources are. Because the last thing you would ever want is that people make a triage decision in hospital A, thinking that we're all out of ventilators, but in fact, there are ventilators available at hospital B just a few miles away. So that issue of being very situationally aware and having repeated assessments is a major component of, um, of this. And it showed up in Hurricane Katrina as a terrific example. This is Louis Armstrong uh, Airport in, um, in New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina. And the disaster response team that was flown in there to help um, initially black tagged a number of patients that they thought were not going to survive um, and so black tag means unlikely to survive, and therefore you should spend your energies somewhere else. Um, but very few of those people actually ended up dying. And the reason was because they would be re-triaged a few hours later when new resources arrived or new capabilities arrived to fly people out. So many of the people who were initially triaged as black tag ended up getting out and being treated somewhere else. So it's very important um, to keep this principle of proportionality in mind and the need for excellent situational awareness and repeated assessments over time. This gets us to these questions about how would you um, allocate resources in the event that there were uh, a real shortage. So if literally you did not have enough ICU beds for all the people who need intensive care or you did not have enough ventilators or breathing machines for everyone who needed one. And I put this up as a question, so we'll start the, um, so we'll start the, the uh, poll on this. But the question here uh, is, if there were a shortage of ventilators, how would you allocate these? Would you, for example, give any preference to people who are healthcare workers? So if, you get, if you're a healthcare worker and you get ill while caring for COVID patients, should you also get preference in receiving a ventilator if there is a shortage of ventilators and there's not enough ventilators for everyone? Um, and I gave you three options here. One is you get to the front of the line. The other is, well, first you would uh, look at clinical factors and decide, well, who's most likely to really benefit from the ventilator? And if you had two people who are tied, then you would give preference to the healthcare uh, worker. Or no, you should be triaged just like everyone else. People, uh, people who get the illness um, during uh, work should, be, or should get uh, no, no particular preference. And there, there are arguments on both sides of this, and I'll just tell you quickly what they are. Um, the two main arguments in favor of giving some preference to healthcare workers is the idea that of reciprocity, that people who take a, an extra risk should also get some extra benefit. So there's a sort of contract there that if you're going to continue a job that's very risky um, during a pandemic, say, that if you end up getting ill, you should get some benefit. The other argument is what's called the multiplier effect. The idea that if you are um, a healthcare worker, your survival can actually help other people to survive. So if you save one healthcare worker, that might end up saving additional lives later. Um, there are a number of arguments against these, starting with the fact that how do you define a healthcare worker? How do you know whether someone got ill while they were on the job? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you separate out people who are healthcare workers from say other first responders or should you? What about policemen? What about firefighters? What about people who are forced to work in supermarkets? What about people who are forced to work in meatpacking plants? And why shouldn't they all get that same uh, preference? And by the way, 
healthcare workers, um, often are healthcare professionals who already sit in a position of relative privilege in our community. So I haven't seen the results yet. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this um, actually reflects what we decided for the state of Colorado. Um, so in the state of Colorado, uh, if we were to need to triage, which by the way, we have not, and everyone hopes we never do, but if we needed to triage um, things like critical care resources, um, we would first look at clinical factors and who's most likely to survive um, if they get access to the, the shortage, uh, whatever's in shortage. Um, but if there's a tie between two or three or five people and one of them uh, got the illness as a result of their work, um, that that person would get, uh, would get some preference. So that's interesting. Um, this has been very controversial, by the way. Uh, nationally, um, there are states that have done that, that will, who've done what we've done. There are states that have very explicitly said there will be no preference given to healthcare workers, and there are states that have uh, that have gone in different in the other direction. Um, one point I want to make about rationing: uh, there is an oversimplification that is often used when you start talking about rationing that in a catastrophe, in a sort of lifeboat situation, where you only have a certain number of seats in the lifeboat, that you should just save the most lives and that all other ethical considerations get shoved to the side in, in a deference to just try and save as many people as you possibly can. And there are a number of actual problems with that, starting with the practical problem of how do you know who's most likely to survive? And I'll tell you that for COVID-19, our capacity to predict who's going to survive and who's not is not very good. So it's difficult for us to use just clinical criteria to decide who is most likely to survive. And by the way, when you say most lives, what do you really mean? Do you mean the most people who will survive for the next six weeks? or the next six months, or the next year, or the most life years. So should um, a 20-year-old and a 60-year-old, who both have the same likelihood of surviving the immediate illness, should they get triaged the same? Um, and there's a lot of debate about these issues because um, defining the most lives, it turns out, is not that easy. Um, there have even been people who talked about looking at productive or quality life years. Um, I would say most of us um, in the ethics uh, field have argued against that um, and especially argued against the idea that someone in medical care would get to determine someone else's quality of life and decide that quality of life is not worth saving. Um, we know sort of from history where that kind of thinking can lead. And so we've, we've argued strongly against that. But what about say women and children first? That's a very traditional way of deciding who gets in the lifeboat. Um, what about first come first served? And should the people who are lined up first um, get this? And what would be the implications of first come first served, right? First come first served means you basically use the resource until you're done. And then when people arrive, you just say, sorry, we ran out. Well, that could be a real problem if it turns out that the first people who show up are already the privileged people in society. Um, and what about ability to pay, which is, after all, how we um, allocate many things in our society um, in the United States. People who can pay more often get more access. And if that is not how we want to distribute things, in a pandemic, then we're gonna to have to specifically um, organize the triage processes to avoid that kind of thing happening. The, the main point I wanna make here is that while saving the most lives is important, um, it is also important to remember these other principles, including things like proportionality, including things like equity, protecting the most vulnerable among us, looking at the hardest hit communities and trying to figure out how to ensure that resources are getting to those communities. The notion of reciprocity comes up. The notion of protecting the continuation of a good society. How do we make sure that in the process of doing triage, we don't destroy social trust? that we don't end up making decisions which lead for people to mistrust the healthcare system. And we need to respect uh, those who are dying and we need to respect those who might say 
you know what, in a, in a catastrophic circumstance where we are actually triaging resources, you can put me to the back of the line. Um, and there are people who will say that. I, I've had a number of people e email me about this because this is sort of a controversial thing that, um, that has been reported in a few newspapers. Um, and so I end up getting feedback on it. Um, and, the, and the feedback is there are a number of people who worry about um, people saying, put me to the back of the line, that, that even raising that as a question could be um, subtly coercive or, or overtly coercive for that matter. Um, but there are also people um, who've sent me notes saying, I totally get it. And, um, you know, I've lived my life. And if I, if I were uh, very ill with COVID and there were a limited number of ventilators, I would give mine up for, uh, for someone else. Um, so let's put up question number three here, which gets at this question of personal liberty and, um, and protecting the community. And this is uh, perhaps the most controversial question I'm going to put up here, but there are, there are folks who have pr uh, recommended that if you today are choosing not to wear a mask, um, that if you were to get sick and there were a shortage of resources, that you should either voluntarily or, um, or, or forcibly be put to the back of the line. So the yes answer here is uh, people who choose not to wear masks today should be denied use of a ventilator if they get sick and there's a shortage of ventilators. Um, the no is, I'll just put this out there, this is our traditional ethic, right? No, we do not punish people for bad choices that they make um, in the healthcare system. And there are certainly plenty of people who uh, you know, choose to ride a motorcycle without wearing a helmet. That does not mean that when they show up at the uh, emergency department with a head injury that we say, well, you know, that was your choice. You're gonna just have to live with it. We don't treat people who do dumb things, right? So we allow people to make bad decisions in this country. Uh, and and, we, and many, many of us think that, the, that there's a sort of fundamental human right um, to make bad, bad decisions and not be punished for it. Um, but this has been a real question that people have asked. Um, and given the, you know, the sort of stakes, um, the difference between this circumstance and the motorcycle circumstance is that there's not a shortage in the motorcycle circumstance. Um, so, uh, so this has been, yeah, look at that. That's very interesting. Um, so we're re roughly split on this. If there were a shortage of ventilators, um, people who are choosing today not to wear masks uh, maybe should be denied use of a ventilator if they get sick and there's a shortage. So that's fascinating. Um, this is uh, the, the last couple of points that I wanna make before we go to Q&A is this, uh, this issue of balancing public safety and personal liberty seems very stark. It seems, uh, as Ron Bayer put this back in the uh, early uh, AIDS era, actually, when there was a lot of discussion about this and a lot of publications about um, the distinction between public safety concerns and personal liberty concerns. And he said these are radically distinct. But I will say that more um, nuanced understandings of this have arisen in the years since this. And I don't think Ron Bayer would probably say this anymore because the reality is that sometimes implementation of public safety measures in an enforcement type way can actually backfire. And I'll give you a couple of examples where disrespecting people's personal liberty by forcing an issue has actually caused people to retrench and to become defensive and to refuse to comply because they feel like their liberty is being challenged or threatened. And I'll give you examples, not from the US, but from the SARS epidemic in 2003 and four. So during SARS, there was a rumor, for example, that all of the city of Beijing was about to be quarantined, as, as happened for Wuhan, right? And in, uh, in the days before that was supposed to happen, it didn't happen, by the way, but it was a rumor. And 245,000 migrant workers fled the city. Now that is a... Um, a quarantine is supposed to keep the disease in that area. Well, obviously, if by implementing a forcible quarantine, you cause people to disperse out into the local communities, out into the countryside, 
that is a quarantine that backfires. Similarly, um, one of the uh, initial hotspots of SARS was Hong Kong's Amoy Gardens apartments. They actually were quarantined. The entire apartment building was quarantined. But when the police arrived to enforce the quarantine, half of the apartments were completely empty. So 50% of the population of those apartment buildings left when they heard that they were going to be forcibly quarantined. And I'll just say, we are seeing this today again, right? So when Wuhan was to be quarantined, 5 million people in a city of, city of 12 million, 5 million of them were le had left by the time Wuhan locked down. Those people are dispersing all over the place. So it is very possible for, um, for measures that are intended to, uh, to enforce a, a personal liberty restriction for those measures to backfire. And in fact, it is possible, and in many instances, it has proven true that a voluntary quarantine is actually more effective than an enforced quarantine. The question is, how do you talk about this? Because, so how do things backfire, right? And I put up this one example uh, in closing here. How could, how could a recommendation to wear a mask backfire and have people say, I'm not going to wear a mask. That's an infringement of my personal liberty. And the, and the consequences of that have been tremendous, right? This is just one case, but it's really a stark case of a church's choir practice in Skagit County, Washington, where uh, over two and a half hours, one person in the back of the choir who had mild symptoms, but who came to choir practice anyway, and sang, so, you know, belting stuff out. And you can see almost everyone ended up going, becoming positive for COVID. Um, 30, 52 people um, got, got ill. Two people died from this, not the index case, but two others died from this. Um, so this is a really serious, you know, problem if people refuse to wear masks and believe that it is part of the sort of personal liberty. And this happens because of inconsistent communication. And obviously, you know, we've had inconsistent communication from, from the top, but I will also say, I, I, don't, um, I don't think only the administration is to blame for this, right? We also have had some moments along the way, very early in the pandemic, for example, the CDC, actually recommended against wearing face masks for the general public. The reason they did that is because we had a mask shortage. And also we didn't realize very early on how very effective masks are at preventing transmission. And so we've had inconsistent communication which has continued all the way through. We also layer that on top of the notion of mistrust of authority and the polarization of our country into you know, the sort of take aside culture where everything ends up becoming um, sort of embedded in this, if you do this, you're doing it because, and if you do that, you're doing it because, as opposed to a shared understanding of why people would do something like this. And then on top of all that are these legitimate fears about, um, personal liberties and the value that we place on personal liberties in the United States. And so how do we get um, folks to, you know, to understand and agree um, that this is not such an infringement on their personal liberty that it warrants pushback, that it warrants a defensive crouch um, and, um, and refusal to cooperate on principle? Right, because that I think is largely what we're seeing now is this sort of refusal to cooperate on principle. By the way, um, this story is I put up uh, to close here because this is my good news story of the day. Um, there were two hairstylists in Missouri who were both um, infected with COVID-19. They saw 140 clients between them, but they were at, um, I think it was a super cuts, um, and, or it was one of the chain, you know, haircutting places, and they had implemented um, physical distancing, so they were at least six feet away. They had to wear a mask, 
the client had to wear a mask and not a single one of those people got infected. Out of 140 people, and you know how close you get to someone when they're cutting your hair. This is, by the way, why I have such shaggy hair these days. Um, no haircuts in February. <laughs> um, so, uh, so face masks work and they work um, primarily to prevent transmission if you have it and don't know it yet. So that's the, that's the, the sort of ending on this. So I'll, I'll end with this. This is, uh, by the way, a picture of the Ebola River um, in Zaire. I, I put it up because I didn't get a chance to talk about Ebola, but that's the big outbreak um, that happened uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. And, um, and I, I like to think that every time we have SARS, Ebola, HIV, pandemic influenza in 2009, um, from each of these, I like to think that we learn more about um, how best to manage these kinds of situations. And, um, and so I'm trying hard to end on a positive note um, that we can and we will learn from this experience uh, as a community. Great. Thank you. Matt, that was such an informative presentation. Um, I don't even know where to start. We've got a million questions coming in. I've got some of my own. Um, why don't you go ahead and stop screen sharing and we'll just go into Q&A oh, right now for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, Matt, do you have a few minutes if we go a little long? I don't want to spit, take up too much people's time, but we've got a lot to talk about. So let's, yeah, let's go a little bit longer today if that's okay with folks. And if you need to drop off, we completely understand. Um, a technical question for you. So I know we kind of come up with those poll questions, particularly number three, that was a little provocative. Has there been any national polling specifically related to that question that we could direct people to to see that landscape? I have not seen any national polling um, on that question. Um, and I, I fear, I mean, I, I, I really, I, will, I, I put it up because, you know, it's, it's a talk, we're doing this um, to be informative and provocative. Um, but it is quite provocative, right? I, I do worry a little bit about the idea of actually trying to implement something like that. Um, it is extremely contrary to sort of the fundamentals of medical ethics um, to say that you you would be you should be punished for making a bad healthcare decision. Um, and I think even the folks who have recommended this have essentially backed off from from recommending that it be enforced and instead said, look, if you're going to say you're not going to wear a mask, then the least you could do is voluntarily say, if I get sick, I'll stay uh, off the ventilator. I'll stay out of the ICU. I, I would, you know, that, 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 I, that it would be a voluntary sort of, I agree in advance. Now, that said, um, that's what is sometimes called a Ulysses contract. Um, after Ulysses, um, who had his men tie him to the mast of the ship, um, when they sailed past the sirens. And so he could listen to the siren song without, uh, and, and, they, and, and he said, I want all of you to put plugs in your ears so you can't hear it. And no matter what I say, don't untie me from the mast. So these are called Ulysses contracts where people say, no matter what, I won't take ICU care even if I need it. You know, when, when you really need ICU care, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it would be difficult to enforce that contract. So you had talked a little bit about travel, particularly as um, restrictions and quarantine came into place. Yeah. I had been reading some news somewhat recently about the idea around immunity passports, um, right? Where if you got immunity, whether that's through a vaccine or you had the virus and develop antibodies, right? You would potentially be able to move about freely and travel. Yeah. What are, could you talk a little bit about the idea of immunity passport and some of the questions it raises around fairness or, or stigma um, yeah. in regards to that? Yeah, so I find it fascinating um, because, uh, you know, first of all, an immunity passport implies that there is immunity. Um, and so that's the number one um, consideration, I think, is just the practical consideration of um, immunity, right? The recent studies suggest that um, just a couple months after um, having had documented infection, many people lose their antibodies. Now, that doesn't necessarily they mean they completely lose immunity. Maybe they have um, some memory cells and they can, they can respond more quickly. But there is a possibility, as with a number of other coronaviruses, that you could get this more than once. So um, number one is, you know, does immunity mean anything? 
that is meaningful enough that it would be worth the trouble of trying to figure out how to do immunity passports. Number two, the best estimates um, in the state of Colorado is that maybe 2% of Coloradans have had uh, COVID so far. So, um, you know, maybe it's three or four um, percent, you know, but we're still talking about 95 percent of people are still immune, uh, not, uh, you know, have never had this and are and are completely susceptible. So um, it's such a small population right now that it's hard to envision how that would matter that much. Um, but if you were to try and implement this, there are a lot of concerns about stigma and discrimination because there have been immunity passports that have been used in the past and that have been used in uh, ways that have been stigmatizing and that have been uh, very negative. Um, and in fact, they could uh, you could imagine um, if the passport means something, if it becomes a very significant thing for economics, for whatever reasons, um, that people could intentionally infect themselves. You could imagine COVID parties, right? Um, where people are trying to get immune and that could be very damaging. Um, that said, uh, one thing that has not been mentioned very much about immunity passports is the fact of COVID-19 right now is that there's a disproportionate burden of this illness in minority and disenfranchised communities. And if that's the case, those are gonna be the first people to get immunity passports. So if there is some financial benefit to having an immunity passport, um, I actually think it'd be okay to give that financial benefit to the communities that have been hardest hit so far. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I, there's a lot to be worked out on uh, immunity passports. Um, and, um, and I think within healthcare, for example, um, uh, you know, I'm a doctor, I am an infectious disease specialist. I take care of people sometimes who have COVID and, um, and I undoubtedly would feel a little bit more comfortable doing so if I knew that I had already had it. So there is value in knowing whether you've had it. Um, whether, how much value I think is where we could get into a lot of debates. Great, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit, you brought up communication. Um, do you think if there had been more entire, entire communication as a whole, like government spoke with one voice yeah. and had really clear messaging, there would maybe be some less resistance to mask wearing and, and kind of what is the role of politicians and yeah. public facing public health providers like that, Dr. Fauci? Yeah, so I think, you know, there was a, there was a nice piece about this um, from some behavioral economists uh, in the uh, in the paper a few weeks ago. Um, the The problem of communication and clear and consistent communication really cannot be overstated. Um, you know, uh, I'll give you an example: Hong Kong, which has a you know a lot of things that are different between Hong Kong and the U.S. But Hong Kong and the U.S. had their uh, initial cases at about the same time, both in uh, late February. Um, Hong Kong and New York City look a lot alike. Um, they're both about seven or eight million people. Um, New York's a tiny bit bigger. Hong Kong um, also, though, had SARS uh, a decade ago, 15 years ago. And, um, and when this came, despite the fact that it's right next door in China, and they undoubtedly had more initial exposures, a heavier initial burden. Um, Hong Kong, 99% of people in Hong Kong say they wear a mask as soon as this ha started happening. And the government was all over it, right? The government of Hong Kong, despite protests, people in the streets, you remember the Hong Kong protests? So there were people in the streets, but they were all wearing masks. And 99% of people in Hong Kong in surveys say, I wear a mask every time I go out in public. Hong Kong um, has had nine, I think, COVID deaths, nine. New York has had over 20,000. So I think, you know, the, the idea that we were getting mixed messages about how best to prevent spread of a coronavirus and the, and the fact that we didn't have prior experience with a, with a serious coronavirus, right? We were not hit by SARS. Hong Kong was scared to death by SARS and people remember it. Um, and so they took this much more seriously, much more quickly than we did. And by the way, Hong Kong's not the only example, right? Singapore, South Korea, Germany, New Zealand, 
there are, there are a number of countries around the world that really had a whole of government approach to this. They took it very seriously right from the outset. And, you know, they have had outbreaks, they've had continuing flare ups. So they're not immune, right? They're, they're also still struggling with this. It's not easy but their experience has been so dramatically different from ours. And, and it's, it's partly because the public took it seriously from the beginning. But uh, the reason the public take it seriously in part is because the leaders took it seriously from the beginning as well. That leads me to a lot of thoughts around preparedness versus response. And I know we yes. can go off on that, but I want to end on um, maybe one final question since we've been Going along, we have so many more. Maybe we'll get a few captured in our written write up and recap that we couldn't get to today, some of those really pressing ones. But let me give you the last word, and this is a little bit of a big doozy one, so I know you're not going to be able to answer all of it. But um, the idea behind science and scientists who often work in very much uncertainty, right? And they, yeah. it's, they're okay with uncertainty, they're okay with dealing with uncertainty. Right. That's what drives science sometimes. Politics, policy, others are often looking for certainty in their work to make decisions based off of. How could you reconcile the two ethically around the uncertainty in science and how that translate into policy decisions? What are some of those considerations? Yeah, I think your, your point about um, the, the fact is scientists and medicine, uh, maybe in particular, um, is built around issues of uncertainty and questioning right? The, the way we move things forward is by questioning the status quo, by being unsatisfied with the status quo and, um, and raising questions about it. Um, and of course, that's very disconcerting when you get outside of science and you get into policymaking, where people want to know for sure that what they're doing is going to work. And if, uh, it's a completely understandable human um, impulse. Um, and yet it is um, irreconcilable with the reality of the world um, in, uh, in the pandemic, right? We did not, so I'll, I'll go back to the mask example, right? Early on, um, the CDC recommended that the public not buy masks and not wear masks. And, and they, they made that recommendation in good faith, right? But that recommendation was based on the facts as they knew them at that time. And those facts have since changed. Right, so the facts at that time were we have terrible shortages of masks. We really need to save them for the doctors and nurses. Um, and we don't know for sure how effective a cloth mask that you make at home is. So it turns out as we did more research on this, a cloth mask made at home is actually okay. It's not great. It's not an N95 mask, right? It, it's not so much going to protect you from getting it from someone else, but it is absolutely good for preventing you from giving it to others. So everyone ought to be wearing a mask right now. And that was a big, a big switch. Um, there were other big switches that arose along the way, including within healthcare, the idea that you could, um, that you could use just a plain surgical mask instead of the more protective N95 mask. That decision um, was made based on the fact that there was a shortage, not based on the, on the idea that it's safe to wear a surgical mask instead of the more protective mask in a healthcare setting. And to my mind, that was a mistake uh, for the CDC not to be very, very clear about that, that a surgical mask is less effective, we know that, but we have to resort to that because we are gonna run out of the N95 masks. And I think that should have been made very clear from the very beginning, that we know we're, we're triaging now. By the way, we did make that clear in Colorado. So our triage protocols, the first one that was implemented was about using surgical masks instead of N95 masks in the healthcare settings, even though we knew that surgical masks were not as good as N95 masks, but we didn't have enough N95 masks. So we had to triage. Triage happens when you can't do what you know is the best thing because you don't have enough of it. So being very clear when you are doing triage and when you think it's okay to do this, right? It's not okay to triage. You shouldn't feel good about that. It's a terrible thing to have to make that decision. 
but it's a forced choice decision where you cannot do the right thing all the time. So you have to choose when you're going to do it and when you're going to take a second best option or a third best option or a fourth best option. And I, I think that, again, it's about clarity of, of communication. It is also, by the way, about values. And I'll just, I'll just close on this because I think I really appreciate the, the fact that you are willing to spend time at the Museum of Nature and Science thinking about the intersection of science and human values, because I, uh, it's in one sense, it's kind of heartening that so many politicians say they are following the science, including, by the way, politicians on both sides of the should you wear a mask thing. So, uh, you know, they're not all really following the science, to my mind. But the fact that they all say they're following the science is probably a good thing, because it does mean there's the possibility of coming to some consensus about where the science is. And it's not just about science, right? Science is also about values. It's also about these notions, right? You can't make triage decisions based purely on science. You end up making trade-offs. Those trade-offs are not pure science. They are about values. So that question that we put up about reciprocity and, you know, should uh, first line, frontline workers, should essential workers, should they get some preference? in uh, triage protocols, that's not about science. That's about values. It's about how do we ensure that we are living in a world that, that we want to live in. And, and most of us, you know, don't want to live in a pure utilitarian world where, you know, if someone isn't contributing enough, they get killed. That, that's a terrible world. So we need, um, we need a world in which we balance efficiency and effectiveness with things like respect and equity and reciprocity and proportionality. That was great. Um, a wonderful note to end on and absolutely the conversations we're having at the Institute within the museum. It's, it's absolutely around values, it's around science, it's around how those two intersect. It's also around the values within science, right? And those mm -hmm. often get swept under the rug. But I think we, when we talk about how do we trust science and when we build trust in science, those are very yeah. instrumental to that too. So I am so thankful for your time today. This has been a wonderful time for myself and I'm hoping our audience enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Kristen. Great. Uh, thank you all for tuning in with us today. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, we are going to be taking a little break here uh, for the next week. We're going to be off. It's kind of falling around the 4th of July holiday. It felt like a natural little break for us, but we will be back starting on July 13th. Same time, Monday mornings at 8.30 for a two-part series on race and inequalities as it relates to COVID. So that'll be queued up for June, uh, excuse me, July 13th and July 20th. So please uh, keep your eye out on the announcements and postings for those. Um, during this break, we're also gonna be sending out a survey. We wanna hear your thoughts and feedback on what topics you wanna hear for the rest of this series. So please keep your eye out for that, fill that out. We also are gonna ask you about the timing. Are we still really good with the 8.30 Monday mornings? Happy to keep it at this, but definitely want to hear what you all want out of this series so we can make it yours. Um, keep your eye out on Twitter, any of our social media channels, or the museum's website for upcoming announcements. Make sure you're on our mailing list. That's the best way to stay looped in. You can follow us on Twitter on the hashtag at Institute Cy Paul. You can follow the museum at Denver Museum NS, and of course, the School of Public Health at Colorado SPH. Thank you again to our partners at the Colorado School of Public Health. Thank you to our speaker, uh, Dr. And thank you to all my wonderful museum colleagues. Um, it definitely takes a team effort to put one of these on and there's lots of behind the scene folks to make this possible. So thank you to all of you. Um, I hope the rest of your week is filled um, with a lot of kindness and hopefully a lot of thought provoking questions that you start asking yourself um, based on the today's presentation. Thank you and have a good rest of your Monday. <laughs>